So here's the challenge. You take somebody with a full rich life who's published at least 40 books during his lifetime and about 60 books now. Can you capture that whole life and do it fairly in under 20 minutes? This is my challenge. And so to do that, I've decided to include a timeline made by JBS Timelines. I use my data and they have some software that helped me out. And hopefully I can present for you an image of C.S. Lewis's life in just a few minutes that is captures the excitement of his life, but also the impact and those poignant moments that really made a difference to who he was and to how we read him today. All right, so let's begin. Here, we're going to begin in 1898. C.S. Lewis was born at the end of the 19th century and born in Belfast. I know we think of him as an English writer, but he was actually an Anglo-Irish writer. Born in Belfast, uh, he was known as Jack. Uh, he self-named him, you know, like he gave himself the nickname Jack C or Jack when he was young. Uh, his dad was a solicitor, uh, Albert uh, Lewis, uh, who was kind of a character, and his mum, uh, who was good at math and uh, taught him when he was young, was the daughter of a minister and they grew up as sort of like middle class strong middle class people uh, in the early uh, in the late 1890s in the early 20th century well when Lewis was like six or seven years old the whole family moved to the house that was really formative to who he was as a writer as a um, as somebody who was inventing worlds with his brother who was three years older than him and they had this great garden of adventures it was just a, a great place to grow up it was called little lee a house filled with books that lewis was allowed to read any book that he wanted and he grew up uh, with that great literary background that made him such a great writer and speaker uh, when he grew up he also became great friends with his brother who even though he was three years older they worked together in Little Lee to create kind of a club for themselves where they were able to write literature and enjoy the things that they love books and and things like that now the the story isn't is actually kind of a sad one in 1908 before Lewis turned 10 years old uh, his mother died and he loved his mom and she was really special to him but she died and uh, he, he said this like 45 years later with my mother's death all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable, disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, many stabs of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. I mean, what a great statement of what happens when uh, young loss destabilizes us and sets us onto this new path, this, this less stable, more dynamic path of who we are as people. Well, it was such a, a passionate and difficult time. Actually, uh, Lewis's father lost a brother, his own father, and his wife all in the same season, like within a, a few weeks of one another, uh, all in that same year. And Albert Lewis was distraught. Uh, as a result, just three weeks, too soon, too soon, but three weeks after, after his mother's funeral, Jack was sent to boarding school, a school that he hated, an abusive school called Wynyard in Herefordshire. Uh, he actually called it uh, Belson uh, in his autobiography. Uh, and then uh, when he complained, and eventually the school was shut down because of the professor, uh, the, the headmaster went mad, uh, he was uh, sent to his local uh, s local uh, boarding school called Campbell College. And, and he, he grew sick, and it just wasn't the right place for him, so that eventually he went to Sherbrooke House to, to Malvern, uh, a famous uh, s school in England. And during this period, I mean, there were some strengths gained, and probably Lewis is a bit too negative about this, but he drifted academically. It was not a great period for him, and he became an atheist in this period. An intriguing kind of development for him. And if you look at the timeline, I mean, this is like six years of C.S. Lewis's life that he spent away from his father, away from his home that he loved while he was uh, in boarding school.
In 1914, uh, during the, the end of that period, uh, C.S. Lewis befriends Arthur Greaves, one of his neighbors that he never really met, but they shared this love of Norse mythology, leaning over a book and saying, oh, do you love this? Well, like, you like this. I didn't know that anybody else liked this. And they shared that love, and they actually became lifelong friends, sharing letters, uh, and, and really, really one of the most important friendship in C.S. Lewis's life. Well, in, in 1914, Lewis wasn't doing well in boarding school, so C.S. Lewis sent him to study with uh, uh, Kirkpatrick, W.T. Kirkpatrick, the great knock, who had been a tutor both to Albert Lewis, the father, and to Warren Lewis, C.S. Lewis's brother. Uh, at the uh, <laughs> at Great Bookham in Surrey, uh, you know, Lewis lived this idyllic life of reading and studying and learning languages and and challenging himself and writing poetry. It was just this brilliant period, and his letters of the era are just great. Meanwhile, World War One is is raging and behind, and still Lewis in just invests himself in the discovery of academia and learning and growth, including encountering great books such as George MacDonald's Fantasties, which would go so far as to baptize his imagination, to challenge and begin to change and plant seeds in his life of a spiritual development that would come much later, first through literature and then in his own spiritual life. Well, the war moved on. What was supposed to be a short war was a long war and a deadly war and a terrible war. And eventually C.S. Lewis knew that he had to sign up. He volunteered uh, in 1917, joined the Officers Training Corps, which of course gives certain kind of advantages and gives him a certain kind of leadership role in the war. And he was in the trenches by his 19th birthday. He fought, he almost died, he, he liberated some people, uh, and eventually, after a number of periods uh, in hospital where he, he had trench fever, uh, he was hit with a blighty wound, in, wound in, in April 1918, so he had shrapnel in his body. He was sent to hospital to recover, and by the time he was really recovered, it was pretty close to the end of the war. Uh, he was demobbed on actually Christmas Eve, demobilized Christmas Eve 1918, just six weeks after Armistice was declared on November 11th, 1918. Uh, Arthur Greaves, Lewis's best friend, wrote in his diary on, on the 27th of December 1918, Jack's home. He had taken a cab home and rejoined his family for champagne and celebration. Even Warney made it. Most of Lewis's friends died, including his best friend, Patty Moore. But Warren and uh, Jack Lewis were home together uh, with their father Albert and with Lewis's best friend Arthur Greaves. Well, C.S. Lewis uh, has this academic desire. There's really no career that's better for him than academia, so he decides to go up to Oxford. He competes a number of times to get in to Oxford. He wins a scholarship but fails the math entrance exam. As a, a war vet, however, he is allowed to go up even without the entrance exam, and he does super well. He earns uh, three firsts, a triple first, first class honors in, in classics and uh, the greats, which are the humanity, letters of humanity, the great uh, writings of literature, and English language and literature. This triple first distinguishes him, but finding an academic job is quite tough, and he, he, he is in some degree of worry because though his family is relatively well off, they're not terribly good financial managers, uh, and they're still just middle class. Lewis can't just live a life of literature. He's not sure that he'd be able to make it. He does get published in this period as a student, or almost as a student in Oxford. Uh, Spirits in Bondage, his first cycle of uh, poetry is published, a number of short lyric poems, some very interesting and sometimes angry pieces, a very good example of war poetry, but especially a good example of somebody who's on a spiritual journey. He publishes secretly, uh, as he does with his next poem, Dimer, as Clive Hamilton, Hamilton being his mum's maiden name. Somewhere around 1920, Lewis has connected with his best friend's mom. His best friend in the war was Patty Moore, so not Arthur Greaves back in Belfast, but Patty Moore at war. Patty dies, and Lewis reconnects with Mrs. Moore, his mom, uh, Patty's mom, uh, and her young daughter, who's a teenager at the period, uh, Maureen. 
And Maureen goes on to be a lady of all things, you know, um, kind of aristocratic moment. But at this period, they're very poor, and C.S. Lewis decides to take the dangerous path of living with Mrs. Moore. Uh, it, it breaks school rules, it goes against societal propriety, it's just a terrible idea, and scholars are still split exactly on what happened in that relationship. But it does look like he had an intimate relationship with Mrs. Moore that transformed over a period of time. At some point, at just around the time that he's converting to Christianity, they buy a home together, and they begin to live more as household partners, and then eventually, actually, it's more like an adopted father and mother kind of situation. And Lewis does attend to Mrs. Moore until her death, including daily visits to her hospice care in a nursing home in the last couple of years of her life. Well, C.S. Lewis uh, does actually succeed after his triple first. Uh, he takes a, a you know a low-paying position as a philosophy tutor for a year in 1924, but in 1925 he's elected as a fellow of Maudlin. This makes him a don. This means that he's tutors students. He does some lectures, although the lectures are usually optional. Lewis ended up being a great lecturer, so they're very popularly attended. Uh, but he ends up spending most of his time working individually or in small groups with students and uh, developing his ideas in that format. And that's how he spends the next 30 years. In fact, although most people would have gotten a chair within that period, especially with the kind of publications, academic publications Lewis had, Lewis never did. He was just uh, a popular writer. He, he made the wrong decisions that, that embarrassed the university. He, he spoke as a, a Christian theologian when his uh, area was uh, literature, not theology. Um, and he also did some political things on campus that made it difficult. And so, although it was not ideal, he didn't make a lot of money, and it was a difficult job, he did spend 30 years dedicating his life to students. And some of those periods were pretty intense, you know, uh, su such as the early 30s when he's getting his feet, and then uh, at, at the end of World War II when all the students come back from war. It's a big part of his life. Lewis as a teacher is an important feature. Now, also in this period, the mid-1920s, C.S. Lewis meets Jaron Tolkien. Now, friendship becomes really important for Lewis. It's not just Warren, his brother, and Arthur Greaves of his child, his lost friend Patty Moore and War, and all those other fellows and comrades who fell. It's actually the philosophical and literary friends that he meets in Oxford that really transform and change his life. Owen Barfield was one of the early one of these, Cecil, Cecil Harwood as well. But especially J.R. Tolkien, the, the great uh, genius of letters uh, and, and words and, and uh, myths that comes to us, Lewis and him connect in the mid-twenties, and by the early thirties they're meeting together, sharing their work, and encouraging and challenging one another on in their growth. They will do this being joined by other people over times in a club called the Inklings that met twice a week, once in a local pub called the, the Bird and the Baby, colloquially, but really the Eagle and the Child, and once in his Lewis's rooms. By the late 1940s, that began to fizzle out, and they were only meeting in the public pub through the 1950s. And there were challenges, you know, when Charles Williams came and then passed away, and then when Tolkien and Lewis began to drift apart. But they supported each other right into the 1960s. You know, when in 1954, Tolkien supported Lewis for a chair in Cambridge, and Lewis, uh, later in 1960s, sponsored Jared Tolkien for a, uh, an award of, of literature, a Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize in Literature. So they were there for one another and created really uh, some of the most dynamic literature in history from the, the literary club called the Inklings. Now, 1926, we're going to move quickly now. Dimer is published. This is an absolute flop. A really interesting poem of Lewis's, but not a successful one. Of course, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but we know that Lewis is a famous convert to Christianity, but a reluctant one. And any time during this talk, you can pause the tape and you can actually look and read these things. But in 1930 and 1931, Lewis does finally come to faith, first philosophically to an understanding of God, and then through friendship and challenge and ideas and exploration and experience and understanding of who Christ is as the Son of God.
Well, Lewis uh, moves into the kilns with his brother Warren and with Mrs. Moore in 1930, and for the next 25 years to the end of his life, he actually spends, or 35 years to the end of his life, he spends his time here. And it's just such a great transformative place and a great place to visit in Oxford till this point, and one that's really evocative of you know, uh, Narnia. It's evocative of the worlds that Lewis is involved in and creates in his literature. In 1936, Lewis begins his academic career with the allegory of love, which changed the way that literary history was done. There were other of these groundbreaking books, including Oxford History of English Languages, 16th Century Literature, Excluding Drama, which is this huge, gorgeous magnum opus, but also like the very popular and controversial Preface to Paradise Lost, still read today by scholars, and uh, the more popular book, The Discarded Image, which helps normal folks like us read some of the medieval poetry. Now, with Out of the Silent Planet in 1938, this kind of weird H.G. Wells kind of style uh, sci-fi book, Lewis begins this great fiction career, which is how most of us will know him. You know, he wrote, you know, three sci-fi books, two theological novellas, seven Narnian chronicles, and then a literary fiction called Till We Have Faces. I mean, more than a hundred million of these books have been in print, and then think about all the viewers of the Narnian film since then. I'm still waiting for someone to adapt these sci-fi books. In, 19, uh, in World War II, Lewis positions himself as a Christian apologist. Although the books are spread out over a large period of time, the problem of pain Mere Christianity and Miracles were largely written during World War II, this really important moment that Lewis was able to speak as a Christian to his culture. C.S. Lewis in the same period writes as a controversialist in the Screwtape Letters, as a senior demon writing to a junior demon. Uh, and these letters, of course, made Lewis famous, and so they're really important, but they're still a good read about the spiritual life today. In that same period, uh, through the 40s and 50s, Lewis serves as the president of the Oxford Socratic Club and, and really gets his, his debating voice out into the world. Uh, he becomes the Christian voice on BBC. We know this, Mere Christianity being one of the most important 20th century apologetics books, really making Lewis one of the leading Christian English-speaking figures in history. Um, Lewis, in 1949, is exhausted and yet... You know, he, he actually lands in a hospital uh, because of anxiety or depression or just a physical collapse, and yet he manages to come up in quick succession over a period of five or six years, writes the entire Narnian Chronicle, uh, this, this septep, this cycle of books that, of course, we all love, that, that uh, so many children and adults love throughout the world, and that dominates this period of the early 1950s. And, and near the end of that Narnian period, C.S. Lewis moves to Cambridge, a, a difficult move, one worth spending more time on, and becomes a professor. And what's interesting about his time as a professor, it gives him more time to write, and he writes about a dozen books during that period of 1954, when he gives his inaugural lecture, until his retirement in 1963. He writes a memoir in 1955, weird, a little idiosyncratic, but one that's good if you are interested in understanding Lewis's idea of joy or Zane Sook, the way he, he feels drawn to God. Uh, of course, 1950s is the period where he falls in love beginning as pen pals and then and then increasing in friendship uh, in in some sort of business partnership lewis suddenly finds himself married in the 1950s to a woman who's dying they have a deathbed uh, blessing a uh, wedding blessing in 1957 but joy suddenly revives and her cancer recedes for a period and during this uh, time they're just madly in love and lewis writes a, a whole bunch of books and she really helps re shape his career. Unfortunately, it didn't last. In 1960, Joy died of cancer following a trip to Greece that they had together, this lifelong dream they had together. Uh, Lewis wrote a memoir called Grief Observed that remains a really poignant observation of what grief and loss do to our hearts. Now, when we think about Lewis uh, and his career, uh, this is just a few of the books. It's actually a puzzle that somebody made, which I think is kind of a cool puzzle. Lewis, over his career, you know, wrote about 40 books, including five books in that lonely, dark period after his wife died. Uh, 
you know, I don't know. This is a huge, this is a huge amount of literature that's been left to us in so many genres, apologetics, spiritual growth, cultural criticism, science fiction, fantasy, literary fiction, poetry, criticism, history. It's just all over the place. And I will encourage you to take a look and develop uh, your tools of reading Lewis because he leaves something for everyone uh, in the text that he has given us. Of course, every story must end, and so does C.S. Lewis's. You know, on the 22nd of November, 1963, in the shadow of JFK's assassination, C.S. Lewis passes away in his home with Warren at his bedside. He's just about nine, he's just about 65 years old. He's buried in the graveyard of Holy Trinity Church, Haddington Quarry, and he shares this gravestone with his brother Warren. And that's really the legacy of C.S. Lewis. And I managed to do it, 20 minutes to talk about C.S. Lewis's life. And I hope that you can explore more in much more depth, but I wanted to give that nice little snapshot of who he is. So make sure to follow me at Brett and Dana on Twitter. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and always check out my work at www.apilgrimandnarnia.com.